and it's recording. So welcome everybody. Uh, we're happy and proud to have with us today Liat Pirir from uh, the Department of Economics at Princeton University. He's been researching very varied uh, topics from repeated games to experimental economics via matching social networks. She has editorial positions in too many journals for me to number now, but today she's gonna tell us about dominance solvability in random games. Thank you, Liat, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Galit. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna tell you about this project, which is not brand new, but we're revising it right now. So comments would be particularly useful. It's with my colleague, uh, Noga Alon, and with uh, a student who's graduating this year, Carol Rudolph, that you should uh, remember. All right, so uh, a game is uh, strictly dominant solvable if the iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies generates a unique Nash equilibrium. And for most of what I'm going to tell you about today, I'm going to focus on pure strategy, strict dominance solvability, which is a fundamental concept that's been applied across the board to in various applications. So voting, auctions, global games, and so on and so forth. Now, implementation in iteratively undominated strategies is very appealing. Uh, first of all, it's simple. It's simple in the sense that all that the iterations depend on are, are ordinal rankings of payoffs, so you don't actually need to know precise payoffs. It's also robust or simple, both for the players and any designer that you might think of in terms of beliefs that players hold, so you don't really need to have precise beliefs about what other players are, are doing. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the number of iterations required may be large. So when we think about dominant solvability, usually we don't restrict the number of iterations that are required to reach the unique Nash equilibrium. Now, this is uh, uh, might be an issue because we know from a wide array of experimental work that that going through multiple iterations is difficult. So just to give you a sense of this, this is uh, using data that was given to us generously by Drew Fudenberg and Annie Liang, who ran 200 random three by three games. And what you're seeing here is sort of the compliance frequency as a function of the quote unquote complexity of the game in terms of how many iterations are required. So if you start from the right, uh, in games in which there is a, a, non, uh, a, a unique Nash equilibrium that is pure, but that are not dominant solvable, we see sort of the lowest rate of compliance with the Nash equilibrium. And as you move to the left, you see sort of incremental increases as a function of the number of iterations required. Now, the baseline of one third is just the, that you see in the dashed horizontal line is just the baseline where players you randomly picking an action. Uh, so they're doing better than that. But the number of iterations is clearly important. All right, so our goal in this project is to characterize features of the iterative elimination procedure and in general games. That's the goal. And the more refined goal is to understand three facets of what we think of as game simplicity. So the first one is how common are strict dominant solvable games. These are very appealing. We focus a lot of attention on them. We want to understand how, how, how uh, likely they are. The second uh, type of question that we'll ask is how complex they are. So conditional on being dominant solvable, how many iterations do you actually need? And the last question is how complex are surviving games? So, you know, as you might anticipate, the likelihood of solvable games is going to be very low, but still there might be usefulness to the iteration process if it eliminates a lot of actions that players need to consider. So we want to understand how many actions are left over. So it's just to foreshadow what I'll show you today, I'm going to focus mostly on two by n games, just because it will allow me to show you some intuitions more directly. 
Um, but I'll try to kind of give you a sense of what happens for larger games as well. So with two by n games, the probability declines rapidly, as you might expect. In fact, we can show that it declines at the rate of one over square root of n. And as you increase the size of the game, that probability declines more and more rapidly um, and in, in the structural form. Now, in terms of the complexity, for two by n games, conditional on being dominant solvable, the number of iterations that is required uh, approaches three, which is the maximum possible in two by n games. And for general games, it increases rapidly. So this is a little bit alarming given the, 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 the wide variety of lab evidence that suggests individuals' limited ability to go through more than two iterations. Now, in terms of how complex surviving games are, that's where the silver lining comes into play. So at least for two by n games, the number of surviving actions um, is, is relatively small. Did I just lose the share? That's great. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Let me try again. I can find the ball. Okay. Oh, my Adobe crashed. Sorry. I'm so sorry. All right, back in business, I hope. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so in terms of the, the surviving games, that's where the silver lining comes into play. So the number of surviving actions is of the order of log n. So relative to n that we started out with, that's actually a vanishing uh, fraction. Um, this is true as long as the game is fairly unbalanced in terms of the number of actions that each player has. Um, if you have a, a, a perfectly balanced game, there's practically nothing to eliminate asymptotically. So, so the process of uh, iterated elimination in all likelihood doesn't help you at all. All right, I, I don't have time uh, to go in detail through uh, the related literature, although it certainly exists. So uh, just in broad strokes, uh, there are various applications that use dominant solvability. It relates to robust implementation via mechanisms that, that, uh, that are simple in the sense that they implement dominant solvable, that they implement through dominant solvable solutions. Um, there's some work uh, in the past, both theoretical and experimental, that considers random games. Uh, it also relates to rationalizability, um, which allows for kind of uh, uh, intuitively or roughly mixed strategy domination, which if I have time, I'll talk about at the very end. And we are using some combinatorics results from the math literature. All right, so here's the setting. So we're looking at non-cooperative simultaneous move one-shot complete information games. So this is a mouthful, but what it really uh, uh, implies is just your, no your standard normal form game. There are two players, row and column, with each with a finite action set. And I'll denote by M the set of actions for row, say, so one through M, and by n, the set of actions for column. Now, uh, because we're focusing on pure strategy, strict dominance, what matters is the ordinal payoff ranking. So the precise payoffs don't really matter. Now, let me show you with a, a very silly example, kind of how permutations are a useful way to generate payoffs randomly. So let's think about columns payoffs in this particular example. So clearly the second action of column is dominated. It's dominated by the third action of column. 
Now, what matters for determining this domination relation is only the ordinal ranking of the payoffs. So for instance, if we, all that matters here is that in the first row, uh, action three gives the highest number, action two gives the second highest number, and action one gives the lowest number. And similarly for, for the second row. Right. So in other words, we could capture everything that's relevant for dominance through these permutations of the rows payoffs. We just need to prescribe the ordering of the payoffs. And this is, in fact, how we're going to think about these random games. So let's denote by S sub N the set of all permutations of the set one through N. Uh, we're going to think about a random game as, as comprised of two matrices, one for the row R and one for the column C, uh, which are M by N. And for each J, uh, for each column's action J, rows payoffs are uniform on the set of permutations S sub M. And for each row action I, columns payoff are uniform on S sub N, precisely as in the example that I just showed you. And what's really important for us is that we're focusing on games for now at least, where these sets of permutations are mutually independent. Now, we're well aware that most games in the real world are not uh, randomly formed. So, so hopefully I have time at the end to tell you something about what happens when you impose more structure as is often done in, in the literature. Now, the advantage of, of writing it this way is that now we can focus on a model that's payoff distribution free. So we don't really need to specify precisely a distribution, but if that makes you more comfortable, you can think about just randomly determining each entry of the payoff game with your favorite distribution. As long as it's continuous and you're determining it independently, we're golden. So the resulting game will be denoted by GMN and that's the corresponding random game. So that's the object we're gonna analyze. Okay. So that's basically the model. All right, so here's what I'll do to you. I'll discuss the main results first, um, and hopefully I have a few minutes to tell you what happens when we have other distributional assumptions or when we think about rationalizability and mixed strategies instead of just uh, uh, dominant solvability via pure strategies. Okay. So, so let's think about uh, the two by n game and start with the row player. So this is row's uh, payoff matrix. And now when we're thinking about the probability that row has uh, an undominated uh, 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 dominant action, basically we want to make sure that the number of undominated actions for rho, which I'm denoting by this u, sub, u superscript r, is precisely one. Now there are two ways by which rho would have one undominated action. Either the top row dominates the bottom row coordinate wise. So we need each of these inequalities of N inequalities to hold. And that occurs with probability of one half to the end or the reverse, maybe the bottom row dominates coordinate wise the top row. And again, that occurs with a probability of one half to the end. So overall, the probability that that row has one dominant action is one over two to the n minus one. So this is already an indication that if we're starting from rho, the probability that we're gonna have, that we can rule out one of the actions is very low, unsurprisingly. How about columns? So for columns, it's a slightly more intricate. So the first thing to note is that we really don't care about the labeling of actions. So without loss of generality, we can fix the top row and columns payoff matrix to be just this identity permutation, one through n. So we'll wanna know what, uh, which of the n factorial possible permutations corresponding to the second row will generate various numbers of undominated actions uh, for column. 
Now, first of all, for, for the expectation, it's actually fairly straightforward to see uh, the number of expected undominated actions. Because if you look at the right most action, that's never dominated uh, because we have the highest number at the top row. So, so that's undominated with probability one. If we look at the second to right uh, action, then that's undominated only if C2n minus one is greater or equal than C2n, and that occurs with probability one half. And we can continue in this way uh, till we get to the leftmost column. Here, uh, the top payoff of one is smaller than everything else. So the only way by which this will not be dominated is if C21 has the highest number or namely N, uh, which occurs with a probability of one over N. So ultimately what you see here is the harmonic sum, which asymptotically behaves like log N. So, so try to remember the fact that for column, the expected number of undominated strategies is roughly log n. And I'll remind you as, as, as it becomes useful later on. OK, but what we really want to know is the distribution. So we want to understand how to construct this f and k, which denotes the number of permutations corresponding to precisely k strictly undominated actions. So I'm going to construct for you a recursive formula for f and k. And to do so, there are two relevant cases to consider. So the first one is that C21 here is less than N, is not the highest number. In this case, this action must be dominated for column. Um, and, and if we're seeking precisely K strictly undominated actions, they will have to come from the remaining matrix. So we'll need k undominated actions out of the remaining n minus one. So if we're thinking about the formula for this f and k, there are n minus one ways to choose c to one, which is lower than n. And for each of these, we'll need to find k undominated actions out of the, the n minus one remaining actions. Now, the other case is that in fact, c to one has the highest number of n, and then action one, the leftmost action of column, is undominated. In this case, we'll need to find only k minus one undominated actions in the remaining matrix. So in other words, in this case, we'll have to uh, add f of n minus one, k minus one. So we get a recursive formula for the number of permutations that correspond to precisely k strictly undominated actions. Now, as it turns out, this, uh, this is a famous recursion. So this corresponds to the unsigned Sterling numbers of the first kind. So now we can summarize uh, everything we know. We have precise formulas. So for any n greater or equal to one, when we look at this two by n game, we know that the probability that Rho can eliminate one of her actions is precisely one over two to the n minus one. And for any k, the probability that column has precisely k undominated actions is the Sterling number of the first kind uh, with the right indices over n factorial, which are all the possible permutations of the second uh, action. Now, just as a kind of mental break, the uh, to think about the unsigned numbers of the first kind, they're really cool numbers. Uh, they, the first person to actually notice them was not Sterling. It was Thomas Harriet, who's this handsome guy on the right, uh, around the 1600s. Uh, and it was named in honor of James Sterling, who lived almost a century later, by Niels Nelson in 1904. So this is a major case of misattribution, it seems. Uh, in the last several decades, it's garnered some interest for a variety of reasons. And, and this is kind of useful for us because we can use various identities and asymptotic results that were done in the 1990s.
Now, it, it, it captures, as it turns out, these numbers are kind of magical. They capture a lot of stuff. So just to give you a couple of examples, in combinatorics, they enumerate uh, various constructs, including the number of permutations of n items with precisely k cycles. And algebraically, they they correspond to the coefficients in the rising factorial. So the rising factorial is this term over here. And as it turns out, there are the corresponding coefficients of the resulting polynomial. And this identity is actually kind of useful for us in some of the calculations. All right, so, so now I'm, I'm heading towards giving you a precise formulation of the probability of dominant solvability. Um, and for that, it will be useful to introduce one more notation, so I hope you'll forgive me, which is the double factorial. So for those of you who don't know, the double factorial is just like a factorial, but where you multiply uh, terms of the same parity. So for example, 2n minus 1 is odd, so we're multiplying all of the odd numbers up to 2n minus 1. And similarly, to n w factorial, since 2n is, is even, we're multiplying all of the even numbers up to 2n. And the Wallace ratio is just the ratio of two consecutive double factorials. And as it turns out, it relates to the gamma function. So it has some nice features that it, inher it inherits. All right, so here is uh, uh, the first proposition. So for any n, the probability of dominant solvability for a two by n game is given by two times the Wallace ratio. And, and that's, that's the formula for it. Now, in fact, the, the two n minus one double factorial, it's an orange here because that's effectively the number of games, two by n games in terms of these permutations, so ordinally equivalent, that uh, are dominant solvable. Now, pi two n is strictly decreasing in n, so it's nicely monotonic and asymptotically it behaves like one over square root of n. So I'll give you some intuition for where we, how we get this formula. So let's uh, think about uh, the process of iterated elimination. And we know that uh, iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies doesn't depend on the order by which we do the elimination. So we'll start with columns. So we just characterize the probability of having any number k of undominated strategies. This is the CNK over N factorial. So now when we are asking whether a game is dominant solvable, well, if we eliminated the number of actions of column to one action, then for sure it's dominant solvable. If we eliminated it to two actions, well, now from Rose's perspective, there is effectively a game, a two by two game that she needs to consider. And so with probability half, the game is going to be dominant solvable. Rho will be able to eliminate uh, one of the actions and with probability one half, it will not be. And we can continue in this way. And because we know how to characterize uh, the likelihood of Rho being able to eliminate an action in a K by N, in a two by K game, we, we have a precise formula. So essentially what the proof does is just sum up over these orange branches of the trees. So essentially we wanna multiply to any, any, any kind of line that comes out of, out of this uh, center and sum up over all of the branches. Uh, and the rest is algebra. So this is what generates the, the proposition. Now, this is just to show you two things in a figure. So what you're seeing here is the probability uh, for a general M by N game of dominant solvability where we vary n. And the topmost graph corresponds to two by n games that we've been analyzing. And what you can see is both the rapid decline. And in addition to that, the fact that this asymptotic description of what happens is actually a very good approximation, even for small numbers. <laughs> 
uh, as we increase M, the probability of decline becomes uh, much smaller and the decline is much more rapid. In fact, we know how it behaves. So I won't have time to kind of show you results there, but we know precisely how it behaves even for general M by N games. Okay, so now let's uh, think about uh, the complexity, quote unquote, of dominant solvable games. And in particular, we wanna know the number of iterations required conditional on the game being dominant solvable. So if we have exactly one iteration conditional on, sol on solvability, so this is a dominant solvable game, so these are very appealing, uh, both row and columns have strictly dominant actions. And we can write the formula for this. So we know that for row, it's one over two to the n minus one. Uh, for column, it's one over n. And we're normalizing here by the probability of dominant solvability because we're looking at that conditional probability. So this approaches zero very rapidly, in fact, exponentially, as you can see. And we can do the same sort of exercise. Uh, I won't go through the algebra for the number of iterations being two or three. And what you can see is already just looking at these formula is, is that as we take n to infinity, the number of iterations goes to three, which is really the maximum number of iterations you could have in a dominant solvable game. And in addition to that, even in these two by n games, which are relatively simple, we're already exceeding what we often see in the lab people being able to do. So, so people often uh, can't have a hard time iterating more than twice. All right, so, so here is a kind of a description precisely of the asymptotic relationship. So the expectation of the number of iterations conditional on dominant solvability is strictly increasing in N. And in fact, asymptotically, it again behaves at the distance from three uh, is shrinking at the rate of one over square root of N. And three is the maximum number possible. So this I already told you. Okay, so let me show you a picture. Uh, so again, kind of two things to glean out of this. Uh, the first thing is that uh, uh, we see convergence, which is uh, pretty rapid to three. Uh, in addition to that, the asymptotic uh, approximation is actually not bad, even for small n. As we increase, uh, the number of actions that Rho has, things become worse and worse. In fact, when we look at fully symmetric games in terms of the number of actions, there is rapid increase in the number of iterations required. Now, uh, a remark on virtual implementation by Abru and Matsushima. I don't know how many of this audience are familiar with this paper. It's a beautiful paper that illustrated that a large class of implementation problems can actually be approximated by dominant solvable mechanisms. So this, uh, this is kind of remarkable because I just kind of showed you that dominant solvability is rare and still essentially what they showed is that it's dense within a very general class of implementation problems. So, so to me, this makes their result even more remarkable than it was before. Um, nonetheless, it suggests that there's a potential vulnerability because um, at the time, they, they weren't focusing on the number of iterations that would be required in, in these, in these uh, approximating dominant solvable mechanisms. Um, and, and that suggests uh, some interesting questions. I suspect that Matsushima actually had this in mind because he has a few papers that are kind of related. So I, I think he probably wouldn't be surprised if he heard me say this. Um, and there's some recent efforts to at least restrict preferences and think about mechanisms that that uh, implement outcomes and, and few iterations. It seems like a useful thing to think about. <laughs> 
All right, so the last kind of facet of, of complexity that I want to tell you about are the number of surviving actions. So uh, for Rho, this is kind of a fairly straightforward calculation. So Rho has exactly one surviving action if and only if the game is dominant solvable. And, and so this we already calculated uh, the probability that that uh, row has precisely one surviving actions is, is just the probability that the game is dominant solvable. So this we've characterized. And uh, the expectation resulting from this is just two minus this probability. So we know that asymptotically, we don't have much hope of restricting the number of actions. Now for column, it's uh, a little bit uh, more complicated. Whoops, let me go through this uh, and, and steps. So uh, when we think about the number of surviving actions for columns, um, there, there are several options to consider. So first of all, this, this is the same tree that I drew for you a few slides ago. Now, in all these orange branches, we have a dominant solvable game. And in that case, the number of surviving actions for column is one. In all other cases, the number of surviving actions uh, is just the number that we got in the first round of elimination, right? So this is what we get. So this tree, this sort of tree, uh, will allow us to calculate precisely the distribution of the surviving actions for column. And as you can sort of anticipate from this graph, one is special. So we're gonna see a spike uh, uh, at one for, for column. Now, in fact, uh, here's the last proposition. Uh, column's number of surviving actions is asymptotically normal. And in fact, uh, it, it has a very nice uh, expectation and variance. Both the expectation and the variance uh, are proportional to log n. Now, this is kind of interesting because if you recall, what I started out with is calculating using this harmonic sum, the expected number of undominated actions per column which was exactly this harmonic sum. So what we're seeing here is something very similar. In other words, uh, if you're going to eliminate something, you're going to do it in one round. Um, and, and that's kind of uh, an even nicer feature. So to the extent that this is the silver lining in this analysis, this is kind of one nice thing that the simplification occurs very quickly. Now, proving this uh, requires some uh, fancy laws of the large numbers and approximation results by Huang uh, are very useful for us to derive this result. So this is just to give you a kind of the analogous picture for the number of surviving actions as a, a function of the size of the game. And as we saw before, the asymptotic approximation does actually fairly well even for small n. As we increase the number of actions available for a row, we see more and more surviving actions uh, for a column. And, and just to get a look at the, at the distribution, I gave you a proposition for this, but this is basically the proposition. You see that it looks normal even for small numbers of actions of a row. And for M, for uh, two actions for row, we have this spike at one that we kind of could anticipate from that tree picture that I showed you. Now, when we look at very large uh, games, uh, like balance games, we basically can't, can't eliminate anything. So you need a fair bit of imbalance uh, in order to be able to eliminate actions for it, for this process to be uh, effective. All right, so these are the uh, 
main results. And now I'd like to kind of give you a sense of where you can relax things, both in terms of the distribution of preferences and in terms of the notion of dominance that we use, unless there are questions. Okay, so, so the games that we often study are clearly not random. Uh, so we wanna understand whether the results are really driven by this uniform distribution assumption. And uh, both experiments and simulation suggest to us that they might not. So I'm gonna give you kind of a hint or a flavor of both types of results that, that make us think this is not super special. So from experiments, uh, we can use 86 uh, lab symmetric three by three games that were collected by Leighton Brown and Wright in 2014. And that's data from six lab experiments. They were not done uh, in order to study random games. They were just done because they related to interesting questions that people were asking. Now, six lab experiments is not that much, admittedly. So this will just give you a flavor of how to compare some games that are actually run in the lab with these random games that we study. So what I'm showing you here are, are graphs that look at both the number of pure Nash equilibria on the left panel and the number of surviving actions on the right panel. And we're comparing random the random games that we're studying to the lab games from later Leighton Brown and Wright. And what you see is that the random games are, if anything, quote unquote, strategically simpler, and that they have uh, fewer pure Nash equilibria, and the number of surviving actions is also smaller relative to the games that have been studied. So this suggests that it's not a, that we're somehow overweighting uh, complex games relative to what the literature is studied. Now, of course, these six games have been handpicked by the researchers that studied them. So this is by no means a proof, but in order to kind of get more of a sense of, of where random games stand with respect to games we're interested in, we simulated a variety of preference structures and, and, and games. So the first one, I'm, I'm gonna look at balanced random games just because we'll want to look at symmetric counterparts. So that makes it easy to compare, but you could also look at imbalanced games and results appear similar. Uh, so, so these are the games that we are studying. You could also consider a symmetric version. So a symmetric game where columns payoffs are just the transpose of, of rows payoffs. Uh, you can think about potential games where it's one matrix that captures the full information of the payoffs for both row and column. Constant sum game, uh, say zero sum game, where we just have that the pay the payoffs for row and column uh, sum up to a constant. So this captures uh, conf conflictual uh, environments and games with strategic complements, namely ones that have non -de decreasing best responses. And we considered uh, both. Uh, broad strategic complements games, as well as symmetric strategic complements games. And last, we have these lab symmetric games that are three by three from, from the data. So I'm gonna show you results from, for all these six categories so we can compare. Okay, so in terms of the probability of dominant solvability, by and large, you see that that uh, our uh, our assessed probability, which is the red line here, is above uh, most of these games, other than those involving strategic complements. But even for strategic complement games, the decline in the probability of dominant solvability is quite rapid and very much in line with what we see for the random games. <clears throat> 
Now, in terms of the number of iterations, they're fairly close. And while we, uh, uh, the random games offer sort of an upper bound here, so in that sense, the random games are more complex than these other categories, they're not more complex by a whole lot. So even uh, games that are symmetric and have strategic complementarities, which are the quote unquote simplest and amongst these classes, the the still when we look at eight by eight games, they already require more than two iterations. And in terms of the surviving uh, uh, actions, we see very a very similar picture across all these classes of games. If anything, again, the lab games are more complex. That there are fewer uh, actions being eliminated. And the rest of the games look fairly similar, uh, even when we look at eight by eight games. All right, so in the last few minutes, I'll tell you about what happens when we consider dominance by mixed strategies or rationalizability. Uh, and I'll leave some a few moments for questions if people want to ask. All right. So uh, for the the first thing uh, I wanna I wanna highlight is that while domination by mixed strategies makes sense to think about uh, in data, it's actually quite hard uh, for participants to do. And so what I'm showing you here is again data from Feudenberg and Liang. And what we're doing here is looking at uh, the frequency of playing dominated actions that are pure or via mixed domination when we are considering utility that is of the form X to the alpha. The reason why we're considering this utility is because in Feudenberg and Leon, they actually estimate the uh, utility that corresponds to these kind of perceived payoffs given the payoffs that participants observe and with, with a parameter of 0.41. So this is basically a constant relative risk aversion utility and the CRRA or constant relative risk aversion parameter is 0.41. And as you, as you increase alpha, you naturally decrease risk aversion. And what we see here is that with respect to mixed dominated actions, uh, we see far more use of dominated actions relative to the purely dominated. So this kind of, hints at, at the idea that perhaps these are indeed more complex to figure out. Now, theoretically, uh, there are a few things to note before we kind of, I, I show you some a range of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the range that corresponds to our different uh, objectives with respect to mixed strategies. Uh, first of all, pure strategy dominant solvability is effectively the ordinal rationalizability of Borgers. So he was thinking about a setting where people were contemplating mixed strategies but didn't know precisely the payoffs of others. Uh, now, Weinstein in 2016 also showed that with sufficient risk aversion, pure strategy dominance uh, coincides with rationalizability. So the two notions just coincide. You can think about that you, you can allow for domin domination by mixed strategies, but it's not gonna matter. Now, alpha equals to 0.41. I don't know if that counts as sufficient risk aversion. So that's uh, for you to judge, but it's something to keep in mind. Now, in general, there are several notions of rationalizability. So probably most of you are very familiar with, with the standard rationalizability where we allow for mixed strategy domination. Point rationalizability uh, looks at the limit of iterative elimination of never best responses against the surviving pure strategies. So it's never best responses against surviving pure strategies at every step. And this is a notion that Doug Bernheim suggested in the 80s. So point rationaliz rationalizable strategies are a subset of the rationalizable stra uh, uh, strategies, which are naturally a subset of the quote unquote ordinal rationalizability or the notions that we're looking at. So really if we're characterizing various features of this set, 
Um, as it turns out, Pei and Takahashi in 2019 characterized features of this set. So using these two bounds, we can get some information on the set of rationalizable strategies. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So what I'm showing you now are, are, are first of all, two limits of the pure strategy dominance. This is basically what, what uh, we're looking at. And the point rationalizability, this is the minimal set that Pan Takahashi described. So this is the upper bound here. And in between, we're considering several types of payoffs. Now pay, the actual payoffs matter because we're thinking about mixtures. So we're thinking about randomly determining each entry from a uniform between zero one from a normal distribution or from a uniform where, where we're looking at the CRRA constant relative risk aversion utilities with the estimated parameter of 0.41. And those are very similar to one another and kind of, uh, if anything, closer to what we are seeing in our analysis than to the other bound. So anything in between here uh, uh, captures a range of probabilities for rationalizable games. And again, the, the main message is that even rationalizable games are going to be pretty rare very quickly. In terms of uh, how many actions are eliminated or what are rationalizable actions, this is, uh, again, the same sort of exercise. And what you see here is that the number of actions becomes fairly large fairly quickly. So even for eight by eight games, that's somewhere between two and, and uh, uh, seven and a half or almost eight, uh, if you're thinking about our notion. And in fact, when we're thinking about these various particular distributions of payoffs, they generate a much closer number to the numbers generated and using our notion of pure strategy dominance. And the last thing is the uh, expected number of iterations conditional on dominant solvability. I'm putting it in the end simply because there are no theoretical results here, uh, at least for point rationalizability. So I can't draw a nice, uh, a nice uh, orange uh, range for you, but they're pretty much on top of one another. You see some divergence here uh, as we let the, the markets grow, the, the games go, grow, but they're pretty close to one another and they're very large which is kind of the important point. So you exceed two or three, which is really the limit that people can do uh, very rapidly. All right, so uh, it's a good time to conclude. So here are the main points. So first of all, getting dominant solvability is really hard. That probably is the least surprising observation out of this study. Uh, but dominant solvable games are complex. So in, in the sense that the number of iterations required generically is very large. Nonetheless, uh, the iterated elimination greatly simplifies games, at least if the game is sufficiently imbalanced in terms of the number of actions. So that's kind of the silver lining. In addition to that, the simplification happens actually very quickly. So with few number of iterations. Um, if we add more players, the qualitative results hold, as you can imagine, getting dominant solvability is going to be even more challenging the more players you add, that it adds more constraints. Uh, and the main qualitative results are robust to alternative distributional assumptions, as I just showed you. So that's all, folks. Thank you. People, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, I will ask. <laughs> I, I might have missed it, but in experiments, have they looked into, do people really realize that there is a mixture that dominates strategy? 
That's always a hard question, I, which I don't know <laughs> how to answer. You know, because many times people approach equilibrium without fully understanding what a best response means or going through the calculus that we would teach in a game theory class, but they develop some sort of intuitive sense that a particular strategy works and we have some learning models that, that justify that. So I don't know if you call that understand or not understand. <laughs> Even when I play a beauty contest with students as experiments, most of them find it quite hard to kind of understand that they should iteratively eliminate, eliminate strategies and now add probabilities to that. Wow. <laughs> but, you know, if you, the beauty contest is actually a great example, because if you repeat it multiple times, I don't know if you tried that in teaching. This is like a, a sure thing. When I teach, I love that because it's a no risk game. Like they always <laughs> learn to converge to zero. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I wonder if we give them a kind of convex combination that does something that's not beauty context, will they actually learn? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> More questions. <laughs> okay, so we thank uh, Yat again for a very interesting hey. talk. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Oh. Sure, go ahead, Bernard. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if my video works. Probably one second. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Bernard. Hi, how are you? Did okay. you use our, how did you find the equilibria of the eight by eight games and so on? Did you use our software, the LRS Nash? I'm just curious. Oh. Okay. Because we have no, software that enumerates all the equilibria of a game. Yeah, no, we developed the wrong. Just, we didn't. We know. didn't realize we should have. We should. Uh, we should have used yours. <laughs> no, we we were not as efficient. Um, I, I'll send you the links. So, yeah, I mean, anyhow, yeah, that would have, be great. I mean, if you want all the Caribbean. Yeah, the reason why we limited it though it to eight by eight was not only because it was hard to calculate, but also. Okay. No worries. <laughs> because um, uh, there are very few uh, dominant solvable games for eight by eight, and we wanted to calculate the conditionals, uh, you know, the conditional number of iterations. So it didn't really make sense to look at much larger games. So it wasn't just because we were inefficient in, in calculating other stuff, in case that's mm -hmm. the, the inspiration for the question. Well, I'm just wondering, because we, use, we have the software and we hope it's used and so it can be improved and oh, anyhow, that, that would be much. great thank you that would so, be great but, yeah thank yeah. you <laughs> okay bye thank you for the talk i stop the recording and we move to people have less formal questions <laughs>